Ain't God good today? Amen. Amen. I had a thought on the way to church this morning, and uh, I handed my phone to my, my wife and told her I said, make this post for me on Facebook, because I thought it was worthy to be shared. You know, a pastor talks a lot about people missing Sunday school, you know, and and it becomes where you have to realize what your priorities are. And uh, I put on there, I s- or I, I told her to put, I said, uh, I said, a lot of people don't come to Sunday school, or if they come, they really don't pay attention. And I said, it's kind of like you're turning a deaf ear to what God wants to say, but then during service, you want him to listen to what you got to say and bless you. And I, you know, and I said, it's kind of like having a one-sided marriage. And a one-sided marriage don't last long, does it? Amen. So today, the lesson is the Christian family. And I'm going to go through and try to follow the book, but I've got some extra I want to uh, throw in also. And uh, But first of all, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 and 40, let all things be done decently and in order. And we was here praying last night, and I, uh, it kind of caught my attention. I heard the pastor, as he was praying, he brought out that scripture as he was walking by where I was at. And, you know, and God always has an order to anything. He did or anything he, he wanted done. And he formed the world and the universe and the animals and us, and he had an order to everything. And God also has an order to the church and to the Christians and to the Christian families and homes as well. And so that's what we want to focus on today, the Christian family. And Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25, or 20, yeah, 22 to uh, 25, and then 28 and 31. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. It says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall and they too shall be one flesh. Ephesians chapter 6 and 4 says, And ye, there, and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And God is giving clear-cut structure of the family concerning authority and responsibility. And number one, divine order of the family. God's plan for divine order. 1 Corinthians 11 and 3 said, But I would have ye know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And then one, a chain of command and authority. Two, Christ Jesus is the head of the husband. Number three, husband, head of the wife, chief authority over the children. Four, wife, help meet to the husband, secondary, authority over the children. Genesis 2 and 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Number five, children, respectfully be obedient unto parents. Well, that would preach all day right there. But the Colossians 3, 18 through 20, 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. 19, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Am I going too fast for anybody? You know, one thing 
Um, and I'll throw this in. Uh, some people may think, well, you know, I've heard this before, you know, and it may not really be uh, clicking to you that, you know, you really want to hear this. But, you know, if the order of the home and the Christian home is out of order, everything is going to be out of order. See, it's just like putting something together. If you, if you buy something from Walmart and you go to put it together, if you don't follow the directions, it's liable to fall apart. You know, I know a lot of times we have parts left over. We say they, you know, they send extra parts. But they're there for a reason. They're there to hold it together. And so the way God set things up and the structure of everything is for a reason. And if we leave something undone, we're only setting up for failure. I, I've known a lot of contractors in my life, and some of them would cheat, try to save money, even from the foundation. And later on, the house is cracking. The foundation's done crack. It's flooding, and, and but see, if they had just went ahead and done things by code, by the way they're supposed to be in, from the start, the house would have ended up better, and it would have lasted longer. It would have stood up. But once it, something ain't right, something ain't, ain't kept right by the order, from there up, it's a mess. You'll have the sheetrock start busting. You'll have a leaky roof. I mean, it's just, it, it just never goes right without the order being right. Says John, I think I'm on C. John, First John five and three. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. D, God's plan is for the highest good and happiness of your family. So, like I said, sometimes we have to go look in the mirror and said, Why is everything such a disaster? Well, is everything in order? Number two, the wife's responsibility to her husband, a reverence. And I want you to I want you to understand something. So I know a lot of y'all do. There may be somebody, and maybe one in the room. So if there's just one in the room that I need to say this for, then I'm saying it for you. But just like I made that post this morning, where it says the the wife's responsibility to her husband, it started out reverence. How many knows that we are? the bride of Christ. So in reference, we, we are the female in the relationship, if you want to look at it that way. When we come to the house of God, it should first be thought about as a place of reverence. So many people don't teach that anymore. You know, they, and so therefore, there's a lot of things in the church that's out of order. But first, there's got to be reverence. You go back to the Old Testament, they didn't know God's name, but everything they called him was the highest of everything they could think of. So it was the New Testament before he actually revealed the name. But they called him a lot of things because they wanted to call him whatever they knew was the greatest. I've heard some elder saints pray, and they refer sir when they're talking to the Lord in prayer because they're still, they were taught from a child reverence. And a lot of people think, well, that's crazy. Well, you're, you're, you're wanting to show reverence. You're wanting to show that importance uh, that you understand that the one you're praying for too is above everything. And so when the reverence gets right in the house of God, the reverence gets right in the home, in the home a lot of things will begin to line up a little better. <clears throat> but Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 through 24 and 33 22 says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that the reverence of her. Verse 22, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. 24, let the wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. 20, 33, let the husband love his wife even as himself. You know, 
And I, and I know it's going through somebody's mind because it always does. Anytime this kind of lesson is taught, uh, people are going to like, well, there's a whole lot of being aimed at the wife. And, and it is. But there may be some unspoken things too here. There's a lot aimed at the husband. A lot of times the husband wants to look at the, and blame the wife but the husband needs to be making sure they're lined up in order for the wife to be lined up. Y'all agree with that? Amen. So we want to cast so much stuff on the wife, and it should be. I mean, it's there. But also, men, we've got to line up. I mean, if they if we want them to to honor us and, and show uh, reverence or, or to submit, we've got to be that godly example for them to submit to. Amen. It's just like the pastor. You come, you sit under the pastor, and you, you've got to submit to your pastor, and that pastor's got to make sure he's that godly example to submit to. See, there's an order to everything. There's an order to everything. All right, submission, B. 1 Peter 3 and 1 said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause right there. A lot of people think, well, you know, why, why even try if my spouse ain't trying? Because somebody's got to keep going and being light to the other. Just because your spouse lives like a devil, don't mean you have to be one. I'm just gonna put it out there, just plain and simple. I mean, you know, every home is different. There's a lot of things behind closed doors that a lot of people don't see. But I'm gonna tell you, if you've got to you got the <laughs> a prayer life and you got a close walk with God and you know you see more than what a lot of people think and you see more than what you let on sometimes and so God will reveal things but uh anyway so be what you're supposed to be whether you live in the one that is what they're supposed to be or not because how are they ever going to see an example if you're not being an example in front of them I uh, counseled some uh a young couple, it's been about a year and a half ago, and they was on the verge of divorce. He was talking to me all during the daytime while he was at work. Well, she was texting me at night. You're like, well, my wife sees everything that comes through my phone. Most of the time I'm sitting right beside her. I've had women say, well, I need prayer, Brother Davis. And I said, okay, we're sitting right here. She'll see everything. I'm not trying to hide nothing. But what I'm saying, though, she was texting me at night wanting us to pray. He was texting me at daytime wanting us to pray, and I was giving them both the same answer. I told him, I said, when you go home, I said, before you go home, start praying on your way home. Pray during the daytime. I said, pray before you get home into that battle. Because, I mean, we've been there. I know you go home from work, and, and your wife's had a bad day. You've had a bad day. Before, before you get ready for bed, both of you are ready for a divorce. All right? Because you're meeting evil with evil. <laughs> But I told him, I said, pray before you get home. And I told her, I said, pray before he gets home. I said, have everything, because she wasn't working. I said, have everything around the house done. I said, have supper cooked. I said, and pray. I said, this, the, the Bible even tells us, you know, we're, we're not we're not warned against the flesh. We're warned against spirits and principalities. You know, the devil works the same way. You may not realize it, but the neighbor down the road is going through the same things you are, you know. It's the same way, the same tools. I heard a preacher put it like that. The devil uses the same shed, and it's got the same tools in it for everybody. There's a tool in there that's going to work on you because he knows how to pull your string. So, anyway, and I told her, I said, instead of fighting this thing on Facebook in this generation, they're going to tell each other off on Facebook. I said, that's just another tool the devil uses. Keep, you, keep your drama off of Facebook. Don't let, don't let the enemy, because see, the enemy don't know until you voice it or you show it somehow. See, God knows the intents of the heart, but the devil don't know it until he hears it or sees it. So don't give the devil that opportunity, that winning hand, to know your business. You know, you could be thinking, I'm going to kill him when he gets home. Well, don't voice it. The devil don't know that yet. So, but anyway, instead of going to Facebook or calling your friends and, I mean, and I'm just going to be honest with you. When we first got married, she, she, she throws me on the bus when she's up here. When we first got married, our number, one of our number one, oh, you all paying attention now. She said, this fish can get good. But <laughs> she leaned up before she could get a. <laughs> but anyway, one of the hardest things for her to learn was 
quit getting on the phone with mama every day. And, that, and that's, that's the case so many times. I mean, we got married when she was 17. So that's what she was used to. And so for the first few years, as soon as we had an argument or as soon as something didn't go right, her whole family knew about it. And that just added to it. Because then you got more people that you're against. And so the, the, the husband and wife has to learn to grow up together, grow together, and learn together. And so when you, the scripture we done read, when you get married, you become as one. You didn't marry the whole circus. You married each other, and you become one. And so that was one of our number one troubles. Pick up the phone, because you want somebody to agree with you. That's human nature. You want somebody to agree with you. And so then it becomes gossip, and then it's never going to be repeated the same way. You know, it's always going to be added to. I've even, I've even told, and, and, and this, ain't a, I mean, this ain't a bad thing. It's just making a, a point. I've even went home and told my wife and, and kids something when I'd come home, you know, for the day and, and say something. Well, it could be five minutes later she's repeating it to somebody, and it's always changed just a little bit. And I turn around and say, no, it wasn't exactly like that, you know, because every time something gets repeated, it's, it's different, you know. And I'll, I'll, go, <laughs> I'll go as far as say, you know, a lot of people say, well, there ain't nothing wrong with different Bibles. Well, every time something is reprinted, it's changed. And you line different Bibles up, and there's some that don't even have the Scripture in there anymore. Some of them's changed it so much that it's changed the meaning of it. So be careful what you're reading, what you're learning from. Go back to the closest thing you can find to the original print so you do know the meaning. And if you kind of break it down, then Google, what does this mean? So the Bible said we have not because we ask not. You know, we can get understanding if we need it. I'll get off of that. That's the pastor's job. Um, anyway, go back to where I was. Where did I get to? Submission. I never started, did I? Peter 3 and 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they, they also may, without the word, be won. By the conversation of the wives, be in subjection as long as you are not asked to break the laws of God. When them, I, you know, I've had that question thrown at me so many times. Well, what am I supposed to do when he's doing this? And then normally, most times, it is the wives that's asking because their, their husband's not in church. You know, and, that, and that's, how I many knows if the husband gets in, most times the whole family will line right up. But it's a hard struggle when the wife's trying to do it without the husband. So you want to holler, I'm a man. Well, be the man <laughs> and come to the house of God. All right. That's <clears throat> Win them with godly conversation. There we go again. Just because they're living like a devil don't mean you have to act like one too. Chase pure conversation and respect. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Whew, that's hard to conquer, ain't it? Key words, submission and reverence. Ex example of submission, a minister of God is called of God to tear, tear up the family roots and move to another city. She follows. We've done that. Sometimes she felt it more than I did, and I was like, mm, you know. But you'll know if you're in God's will or not. And it don't, find out, and it don't take long to find out if you're not. God has special honors. For holy women. That'll preach all day long and night too. Special honors for holy women. How many knows that there, there, there is honor for a woman that a man just can't have? Because they're made different. They're made different. And there was things said in the Bible that God honored when it took place. The women with the long hair. You're like, well, you're getting on hair. Well, it's for a reason. Some people can't, some, some women's hair won't grow long as others. So there's no particular length. You know, a lot of people say, well, she ain't got long hair. Well, if it's uncut hair, it's a holiness there about that hair. I've seen some women that it just wouldn't grow, and they'd cry and cry and cry because it wouldn't grow, and it wouldn't be much around but about their shoulders or whatever. You know, there was something going on that was wrong. But still, God honored whatever it was. So if you, want, if you want glory in that aspect and you want to be honored in that aspect and you want God to use you there, 
trying. The Bible said trying. Don't go off because, well, that man's making me. If you're doing it only because somebody's making you, it's no good. If the heart ain't there and you ain't doing it out of the reverence for God because of Scripture and you want God to use you, then you might as well just cut it off and be bald. I mean, but there's a glory that God will honor about that that a man will never be able to, to, to experience. I've seen women that could take their hair when they felt led and wrap it around a, somebody that was sick or, or a, something about them and place it over that, that place and God use it and honor it. And I'm, I'm telling you, it works. It happens. But a man can live a holy life and look like a man. That will preach too. Act like a man and reverence God and you'll have honor too. First, you'll have honor in your house. All right, where did I get to? See, I'm trying. I'm trying to hurry because I got more I want to add to it. Uh, yes. Okay. Mary Magdalene, one, seven devils. Two at at the tomb. Miriam, sister of Moses. Deborah, judge, delivered Israel. Esther saved the people. Anna prophesied at the sight of Jesus. Philip's daughters prophesied. Lydia, a prominent convert of Paul. Abigail saved her husband's life. 1 Samuel 25. 1 Corinthians 11 and 10. For this calls off the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. 1. She shows her subjection to her husband with her long, uncut hair. Even angels give attendance to this. Three, husband's responsibility. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How many knows if you love your wife, she won't have to question if you love her or not. If you love your wife, you're going to respect her, especially in, in, in public. Well, I've, I, you know, I, I've, I've seen this so many times, you know, the husband throw the wife under the bus, and what I did while ago was just comical to get y'all's attention. But, you know, but if you love your wife, you ain't going to disrespect yourself and, and, and want everybody to see something bad in you. If you love your wife, you ain't going to want them to see nothing bad in them either. And you're not going to give them a reason for them to see something bad. See, if there's something you got an issue with, wait till you get home and talk about that. Don't do it. And, and, and Is this all right, Pastor? You don't belittle. You don't degrade. Because, I mean, you wouldn't want somebody doing you that way. So if you love them, you're going to want just as good for them as you do yourself, if not more. That's That's the right kind of uh, example to, to show I mean, anyway, husband love your wives even as Christ, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself verse 31 for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh there again if the men will act like men and, and grow up spiritually and mentally and physically and, and be the head of the house, then you can expect to be that example for them to follow. And verse 33, Never, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So it's a two-way street. When things line up one way, 99% of the time, they automatically are going to start lining up the other. 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. For the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. That's usually a problem in a lot of places right there. We... I know I'm just going to use our family. Uh, 
we've always had the kind of marriage where we was around each other a lot. You know, when I drove a truck, she went with me. You know, I didn't, I wasn't out there alone and where she couldn't trust me or anything. Because I'm going to tell you, you go out there in the world, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that can happen. But I took my wife with me. She raised her two kids for a while in the truck. She'd take one into the back, teach them schooling while they didn't set up front, and then she'd swap them out. And so we we done everything together, and she caught a lot of slack for that and said, well, actually her mama and her sister both told her, said, I just don't see how y'all do it. You know, it ain't good to be around your husband all that time. If you can get along, why not? See, the Bible said don't give don't give space to the enemy, you know, where they can doubt you, in other words. And so, I mean, our kind of marriage, it worked. You know, we was happy together. A lot of people didn't like it. They thought we was crazy. We should be spending time apart. You know, she should have been here and I should have been there. But when you got that kind of mindset, that's usually why you get a lot of problems. And so, but anyway. But let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband not, hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. And I'm on Paul's right there. I'll put my finger there so maybe I'll remember where I'm at. But going back to that, you know, you have not the power over your own body, but it's your spouse. And she'll even tell you this, and, I, and, I, and this may be a lot more than what some's used to, but when it comes down to even how she fixes her hair, she'll ask me, is this okay? Do you think it's, you know, because she knows what I like. And then a lot of times when my hair changes, it's because she's wanting it to. She wanted it to look a different way. And so uh, years in the past, I used to have a goatee. And I didn't grow up because I wanted to, but she thought it looked good. And so when I got ready and I knew God was dealing with me and it, I, I had, had to shave it, I went to her and talked to her. I said, listen, I said, I know you're going to get upset. I said, but it's got to go. But see, when I knew God was in it, she didn't give a fuss. But see, sometimes we do, you, you'll do that, what it you know, whatever for your spouse, not only, not just because it's something that you really just tickle to death with, but it's to make them happy. Now, that is a fine line there. Don't take that wrong, because your spouse came and saying, well, you know, I'd like to take part in this. You have to be careful. See, go back to, it might have been, was it you last week, I think, that said that, what would Jesus do? So there's a lot of people does a lot of things that Jesus would never do. I mean, and this may be getting off the subject just a little bit, but years I've never been a smoker. I, I just I, that was one thing that never appealed to me. But I was a dipper, and so I snuck around when I was a teenager. Yeah, my daddy was a pastor, but I'm just like I was like any other kid. I done what I could get away with. So at school, I started dipping like the other boys because it was cool. And so then it grew from one kind of dip to another to another. See, it always got stronger. It never gets weaker. It's always stronger. And so I found myself when, when I was married and just doing what I want to do. She's got pictures. I wouldn't show them today, but she's got pictures. This is back before the cell phone had pictures, you know. But she's got pictures of me driving a truck, and it looked like a golf ball stuck in the side of my mouth. Because a little dip wouldn't do it no more. It got to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Then it got to the point, she said, you are going through a lot of dip. So... Did I decrease the size of the dip? No, I done had that, that pocket formed. If, you're, if you've ever dipped, you know what I'm talking about when I say a pocket. I had that pocket formed, and it was it, it would used to a certain size. And so instead of decreasing the size of the dip where I wouldn't spend as much money, I went to chewing tobacco, something stronger. And so then I got to going through several packs of those, but, and then I'd, but I'd have that big old golf ball that looked like sitting inside of my mouth. And so... That was my habit. That, that was my addiction. It wasn't smoking. It wasn't drinking. And in my family history, they, they had a big history of, of drinking. My daddy was a bootlegger before he got in church. But mine was dipping. 
And so I've told this several times in past when preaching. And uh, but we was I knew I was called to preach. I, I mean I was running just just as strong as I could. We'd done lost everything we had several times, and this is still on Christian family. But I y'all y'all help me keep track of time. But I was running from the call that God had on me. And so I did not want to get to pulpit because I was raised better than that. I had enough reverence for the house of God, and I was taught better. I didn't get up on stage when I knew I didn't need to, Brother Inman. You know, today there's, there's a lot of people that will. It don't bother them. But, see, I was taught better. I, I had more respect for the house of God. And, and so I, would, I wouldn't get up on stage when I wouldn't write. And everybody in the country knew that I played music, knew that we sung and everything. But I would, I, I would say, no, 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 not tonight. Y'all go ahead, you know, whenever they ask us to. And so, but I knew, and this is, and, I, and a lot of people may disagree with this. See, the call of God will not leave you just because you're in, 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 a, in a bad situation at the time of your life. See, because when you've been taught all your life and you've got to this certain point and you're running, God is still there saying, hey, this calling ain't, ain't gone. So the Bible said calling is without repentance. And so we, we was living in this place, and, and I had done preached. I mean, this was in, in a time where I had done preached. I had done been what I was supposed to be in, but I got tired of trying. And because I thought, well, I, I, I moved locations. I said, you know what, I'm just going to back up and sit back for a while. That never works without you keep going back and back and back. And so I knew what I was doing. Nobody had to tell me. And during this time, we lost everything we had three times because I was running from God and had to start all over. That's hard when you got two kids and a wife. I mean, I would be making good money, bringing in thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 a week driving a truck, and all of a sudden, job was gone. And I was a driver that they bragged on because I never turned down a load, and it was always on time. I mean, I'd do back-to-back turnarounds, no sleep to get the load there. And they was bragging on me every week, but all of a sudden, something would happen. And I'd lose a job. God was trying to get my attention. See, I, I was depending on everything but God. But anyway, we would move this location, and a lot of people in that area, the churches had changed so much that I, I once knew, and every week I'd go, I mean, I wouldn't write, but I was talking about the churches too every time I'd go to them. And, I, and of course, a lot of people in that area that knew me and knew my daddy and the background and everything said, you need to start pastoring. But well, one thing they didn't know is what I was keeping secret from everybody. See, I wasn't one of these that went out and just openly showed everybody what I was doing because I didn't want to bring shame on my family. That's another thing people don't have. They don't, they're not taught that anymore. But anyway, but still, God knew. And so every time I passed this building, it was like a voice kept saying, that's going to be a good church right there. That would be a good place for a church. Well, it was in a parking lot, had a dollar store on one side and a grocery store on the other. And it said that would be a good place for a church. Finally, after two or three months, I voiced it to my wife. I said, you know, that would make a good place for a church. And it kind of went on. But I knew in my head, I'm not ready for no church. And so then other people got to come to me and said, brother, we, 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 we need you to start a church. We, we need a good church. We need a pastor. You know, this one over here, they, they've let down. They've doing, they let out everything, anything. And there was two or three churches that we really knew around that area, but they had backed up so far on what they once stood for that you wouldn't even recognize the same church anymore. And so even the young people got to come in and sitting at the house and, and saying, you know, we need something. We need this. We need this. And God was, I mean, it was like I couldn't get away from it. So finally we went to a watch night service in a country church way out in the middle of nowhere. And I'd done quit dipping so many times I'd go back and pick it up. I mean, I'd laid it down for a year, and I'd go back and pick it up. But this time I just could not lay it down. And it was because... The call was there so strong, the devil was fighting that much harder. And so finally, I went to the church that night, and of course, it was a packed house and had a good service. Well, at midnight, we was all praying. And so I didn't go to the altar. I knelt down at the bench. I said, God, I said, you see the situation? I said, ain't nothing hid from you. I said, and you know these people are on me wanting this church. I said, but I cannot let go of this this time. I'm talking to somebody. And I said, I cannot let go of this. And, I mean, I was sincere, Brother Blanton. I mean, I, I, was, I was sincere as I could ever be. And I said, God, you're going to have to help me. And so that night when we left that church, I rolled down the window and I throwed that pack of chewing tobacco out the window in the field across the road from that church. And I said, all right, God. I said, with your help. I said, 
I've got to line up and I've got to get ready. I said, because these people need somebody. It wasn't easy. There for about a week, it was really hard. And I had to start praying every day. I mean, I, I was praying every day for more than one reason. I was scared to death at the fact of starting a church. I'd been the pastor's son, and it was easy to play the second role. It was easy just to take care of the music and, and you know, testify or, or whatever needed to be done and sing. But pastoring, I was scared, slapped to death. And so, but I was praying every day. And then there'd be times we'd get in that intensified fellowship, heated argument every once in a while. And, and that's when a lot of people, you know, they say, I just need a cigarette. Well, in my case, my mind was like, you need a dip. Just calm down. I had to fight that. I had to resist that. I had to go pray. So after about a, a couple of months went by, it still, I could resist that. I could resist that when I, you know, something was going wrong. And, 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 but I, and I wanted that dip. I could. I conquered that. But then I couldn't stand and talk to somebody that had a dip in their mouth without that smell. It's like, it's like standing by a steak cooking and you saying, I don't want that. I was lying to myself because my flesh wanted that. So I'd have to walk away. And so then it got to where I couldn't go into a store and watch somebody buying it. I'd look away. But after about six months, I could stand and talk to somebody and it didn't bother me if they had a dip in their mouth. I could be right behind somebody in a store and them buying a can of it, and it didn't bother me because God had helped me overcome that. But see, it took prayer, a lot of praying, a lot of fasting, and, and, and it took staying in the Word. Because see, at the time also, I was trying to prepare myself for the job that I was fishing to take on. And so I had to become the leadership of the home. My wife was trying. I was the one that wasn't. And because of her trying, it's probably the only reason why I'm still here. And God didn't say, you know what? Because she kept praying. And she kept studying. She kept going to church. She kept living right. And then talking to me every chance she could. You need to stop that. You need to stop that. Well, I finally did. But it, it kept her being in there. Because if she had ever let go and went backwards with me, Oh, then we got we got a partner now. We we can go do this thing, you know, until God just gets tired of us, you know. But it, as long as one kept fighting the fight, then finally I surrendered and I said, okay, you know, I, I know I've got a job to do. I know I've got some changing to do. And but it said one husband's responsibility to love and honor her. He is to be Christ-like to his wife. Honor. First Peter 3 and 7, Likewise, ye husband, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Did y'all catch that? You want to know sometime why your prayers ain't going nowhere? There's an order to things. It's more than just coming to church. You can come to church and still not get your prayers nowhere. Things have got to line up. Proverbs 31 and 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. You know, and like I said, I know this covers, it, it's strongly bringing out women a lot. But I'm going to tell you, a good, righteous, holiness, virtuous woman will always bring honor to the family. You think about, if, if you've got some grandparents that's been in this way for years, as you was growing up, she stood out to you, right? You hear more people testifying about, thank God for grandma, thank God for mama's prayers. You don't hardly hear anybody hollering, thank God for daddy. He played a role, but that virtuous woman stood out to him. That's why so many times in the Bible you'll see the virtuous woman used. If you want to be used, learn how to be virtuous. It said, for her price is far above rubies. Christ and his church is the perfect pattern of a marriage relationship. Two keys. Number one, love. I've got to hurry. Number two, honor. 
parent-child relationships, children. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God, there's so much I want to say. It goes back to how you're taught, what, what, what's instilled in you. Even after we got married and our kids was born, my daddy was as strict as day is long. I wasn't allowed to do nothing. And he would fuss about anything that I wasn't doing right. But he'd come to my house. And my wife was raised by different people. What you see today ain't what you always saw out of her. And so when we first got married, she wore pants. And so in our house or, or, or around us, she wore pants. But I would, I would harp at her because if daddy was come, mom and daddy was coming over, I said, hey, baby, will you, will you mind taking them off? And she would put on a skirt. Why? Because I was still wanting to be obedient to my parents and honor the teaching and the raising I had. I wasn't living the perfect, but I was trying to honor my, my raising. And so that, that caused some issues. But like I told her, when I walked by the cast, it, I wasn't like my other brothers and sisters. You know, they had been a lot of change and everything, but I didn't have to leave that casket that day with a lot of regrets and say, oh, I wish I'd acted better. Me and him might not always got along and agreed on everything, but I never disrespected him. I, ne I never did that. And so, as Dare says a lot, you know, uh, honor, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Parents, Ephesians 6 and 4, And yea, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Colossians 3 and 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. One, the child who knows exactly how far he can go is relieved of a heavy burden and is therefore a happy child. That can go two ways. That child's going to know how far he can go. You see a, a child acting up out in public, you know how he lives at home. You see a child in an office somewhere, like a doctor's office, and they tearing up the room, well, you know how they act at home. A child will tell on their raising. It'll show. You see one coming to church, and <laughs> never mind, I'll go on. Uh, two, love, discipline, teach, and be an example. Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go. You have to teach them. You have to train them. They're not automatically going to come here knowing everything. That's why you send them to school. If they knew everything, you could save a lot of money. I won't, I won't never forget. This, this, this is comical, but it's true. I, I, it actually happened. We went to visit somebody in the hospital from church, and the waiting room was full of all the family because he was on his deathbed. And this man, this family that my wife had grew up with, and his wife, she wasn't a brightest bub in the pack, but she was in there, and they, they was a, a mixed couple that had had this child, and uh, and she said, well, will he just automatically speak Spanish, or, and her husband said, yeah, baby, got a switch on the back of his neck, you know, just, <laughs> you have to teach that child what, how you want them to speak, you know, you have to, you have to train them. So it ha something has to be done at home, or you'll see the evidence of it in public. All right, move on from that. Uh, train up a child in the way she go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Exodus 20 and 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Decisions of children and you should have careful parental guidance. A parent should proclaim word, Protect, pray. Number three, Satan fears praying parents. Yes, he does. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, 
and when thou risest up, Job offered sacrifice and prayer for his children each morning. Home should be a godly learning center for Jesus. Three family altars are a must. It must be a prayer life. Because if you don't teach your, ki- your children to pray, they'll never succeed as a growing Christian. A pastor only sees them a little bit of the week, but you're around them every day. You've got to teach them what they need to know at home. Last days, let's see. Now, children and four children were protected from the death angel at the time of Moses by the blood put there by parents. Last days when evil abounds. Second Timothy three and two. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Number one, pray. Victory has was sealed in atonement we need to ex- exercise our god-given privileges i'm gonna tell you if you don't one day you're gonna wish you did how much time i got left how much time i got left that's it all right then well mark this down read titus chapter 1 10 through 16 Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I was going to include that, but my time is out. So God bless y'all.